Welcome back. There's a misconception among the general public that quantum mechanics slash quantum physics only applies to very small things. The flood of pseudoscience in modern day sci-fi movies obviously doesn't help with this misconception. For example, here is something I found on the MCU fandom. According to Dr. Hank Pym, the quantum realm is a reality where all concepts of time and space becomes irrelevant as you shrink for all eternity. The quantum realm is a universe outside of time and space accessible through either shrinking to beyond subatomic scale or magic. Of course, magic is not real and we cannot take this fictional pseudoscience too seriously. Quantum mechanics is extremely powerful and it is one of the most successful theories up to date and humanity's greatest achievement. It is the basis for our technological advancement in the last 80 years and only a minute fraction of humanity understands what it tries to say about our reality. Classical mechanics, which was celebrated for centuries, is merely an approximation of quantum mechanics. And today, I'll show you how we can derive things like conservation of energy and Newton's second law from it. One crucial mathematical tool in quantum mechanics is called the commutator, which describes the commutation relationship between two operators in quantum mechanics, and are normally denoted in square brackets. Here's the definition. The triple equality sign means it is true by definition. As you can see, the commutator of operators A and B is the difference when you apply the two operators in different order. This has a close link with matrices in general do not commute with each other in linear algebra. From now, when we study the dynamics of a system of interest, we normally begin by evaluating the commutator of the two operators of interest. Here are three important relations of commutators and are quite common. You can verify these for yourself by pausing the video and expand out the commutator using the definition above. Memorizing these saves a bunch of time and the expansion of commutators can get quite tedious and cumbersome. We found our mathematical tool and now we're prepared to do some physics. We will now evaluate the time evolution of the expectation value of an arbitrary observable Q. An observable is a physical quantity you can measure, such as position, momentum, energy, magnitude of angular momentum, and its projection onto an arbitrary axis, because angular momentum is a pseudo vector. You can think of the expectation value roughly as an average. When you throw 10 dice all at once, and you calculate the average number that's facing up, you should get a number that's quite close to 3.5. When you throw 100 dice all at once, and you recalculate the number that's facing up on average, you should still get a number that's around 3.5. But the fluctuation around 3.5 each time when you throw 100 dice is less than when you throw 10 dice at once. So as the number of dice you throw increases, our prediction of the average, which is 3.5, becomes more accurate and the fluctuation around 3.5 decreases. You can think of each atom as a single die and you can think of the daily objects that we are interacting with as a large collection of these dice, which is in the order of Avogadro number, which is 10 to the power of 23. Classical mechanics describes the behavior of a large collection of these dice, but does not tell us the behavior of each individual die. Quantum mechanics tells us the behavior of each individual die. Therefore, we can deduce the behavior of a large collection of it. This is why we can derive classical mechanics from quantum mechanics, but not the other way around. Expectation of observable Q is Q sandwiched between quantum state psi. Some courses treat this as a postulate of quantum mechanics, but you can verify this by simply considering the mathematical form of these objects. Q is an observable, so it can be regarded as a square matrix with possible values of Q in its diagonal entries and zero 
everywhere else. The size of this matrix depends on the size of the spectrum that Q can take. The quantum state psi, in this context, can be seen as a vector with probability amplitudes the system taking that specific value of Q. We need all the complex conjugate of probability amplitudes to convert it into probability. The inner product attaches the probability to the corresponding value of Q and add them all up. So the inner product is the sum of possible outcomes weighed by their probability, which is the expectation value. Let's differentiate the expectation value with respect to time and multiply by ih bar for later convenience and see what we get. Let's also state the equation of motion in quantum mechanics, which is the time-dependent Schrodinger equation and its summation adjoint. As we're differentiating a product, the product rule tells us to permutate the differential operator through the product, where we also use the Schrodinger equation to substitute differential operator with the Hamiltonian. We can then express the sum of the first and third term as a commutator. The operators are usually independent of time, because we're not changing the spectrum of possible values the system can take. Therefore, the partial derivative q is usually zero. Therefore, we have established that the rate of change of the expectation value of an observable is the expectation value of the commutator of that observable with the Hamiltonian. This important result is known as Ehrenfest's theorem. In consequence, if the operator Q commutes with Hamiltonian, which means the order of operation yields the same result, then Q is a conserved quantity. For example, if Q is the Hamiltonian, Hamiltonian commutes with itself, so energy is a conserved quantity. We have just derived the conservation of energy from quantum mechanics, provided that the Hamiltonian is time independent, meaning the system is isolated since time dependence of Hamiltonian arises only when some external force is present. This is also why the states of well defined energy are called stationary states. Similarly, if we replace Q with the momentum operator P, we will get this relation and we'll verify this in the next video. The key thing to notice is the right hand side is the negative gradient of potential, and this is by definition the force. The expectation value states there are fluctuations around the average, but these fluctuations are negligible at our human scale. You can understand this intuitively if you go back to our analogy of throwing dice. Replace minus dv by dx with f, remove the brackets, and the hat above p, put the arrows above p and f to denote these are vector quantities, and behold, we have now obtained Newton's second law, the heart and soul of classical mechanics, its equation of motion. This should show you the connection between classical mechanics and quantum mechanics, and the predictive power of quantum mechanics on microscopic objects. However, there's a subtle flaw in this entire argument. Knowing the quantum state of an Avogadro number of particles is impossible, as no one can tabulate the number that's facing up in a million dice and then take an average. To resolve this issue, we we'll introduce something called the density operator in a future video, so stay tuned. Thanks for watching.